facing digital economies and how can communities, states, um, technology companies in the Indo-Pacific region prevent the misuse of technologies and prevent cyber users. So our panel has already been introduced, so I uh, won't waste any time doing that, but I'll start and get right into questions. Dr. Rai, I wanted to start with you. Um, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, we've seen cyberspace and the digital ecosystem grow at an absolutely revolutionary pace. Um, too fast at times for uh, companies and governments to, to contend with. So what are the vulnerabilities that are not only unique to emerging digital economies, but vulnerabilities that are uh, unique to the Indo-Pacific region in general? And I think you give a really interesting viewpoint given your previous position as well as the uh, Chief Information Security Officer um, in the Indian Prime Minister's office. So I'll give the floor to you if you'd like to kick that off. I would say that you said that we are going to have a, we are having a six billion Indian user in the world, that's what you said it there. And then if you look at the number of devices and the technologies which are serving the six billion internet user, is a mind boggling kind of a thing. It's at times it becomes very, very difficult to explain and to count out what kind of technologies and number of technology we talk about it there. Uh, as the time goes on, we are more getting into the heterogeneous kind of environment there. Different protocol, different interface, different applications are running over there. One doesn't know what is what one person is running and what one device is running, other device is running there. So our heterogeneity in over a period of a time is going to be increased significantly and tremendously. When I was sitting on the side room there, I think one of the panelists talk about a world called a 5G there. Now, over a period of time, the bandwidths are also improving, are significantly getting more and more uh, enhanced there. That heterogeneity coupled with the fast access is going to be a compounding effect on the system, system there. Now, the IT has certain particular characteristics there. The, one of the characteristics is that you buy the technology most of the time as on wear basis there. You want to support, you want to patch it up with the security patches there, you want to do anything, you have to purchase that kind of a thing. And that another factor which is which is observed, which is getting observed is that the devices and the systems are becoming more and more software dominated there. And software is a, nothing but a list of instructions you write in any other language there. So the vulnerabilities over a period of a time are on increase. The cyber incident because of the vulnerabilities are on increase. The vulnerabilities, there are vulnerabilities in the technology. There are vulnerabilities which get introduced because of the technology. The, there are vulnerabilities which get introduced because of the technology into the process and methods there because technology is changing so fast that you are not able to cope up with the process and the procedures there. So things are becoming more and more complex. I have seen a very, very complex incidents there and every incident which I have seen is different than what it has been yesterday. I have been in operational for almost more than 15 years there. I've seen very, very complex incidents. How can you, you see that a traffic coming from a organization A, from a country A, and traffic coming to the company B in different country there, in between it is being hijacked and routed and then come over there. Now, this is a, not a vulnerability in the, this was not a vulnerability in the technology itself. This was a vulnerability introduced by technology and the vulnerability introduced by processes there. So, and the every technology device which is being produced is, a, is, is not a secure one. There's nothing like 100% security. There are, uh, there are uh, some glitches there in every technology, in every software, which is packed, patched up over a period of a time there. So what I see and what I have seen over the last 15 years, the cyber incidents space has become very, very complex. And I find the complexity to go up, particularly looking at the new technology, the so-called the artificial intelligence there. 
It's the same technology is a friend. Same technology sees how you are a friend and when you are vulnerable as a friendship there, and the, it can really assess the situation and start reversing back over there. So we are entering into the very, very complex uh, uh, period, uh, era, uh, and uh, I think we need to uh, discuss, debate, how do we address these issues to a win-win situation for the social economic development. It is very clear that uh, uh, technology has imploded into our every sphere of the society and we cannot do without the technology. Thank you. Um, Ms. Mabuba, I'd like to go to you if you'd like to expand on those comments a little bit. Um, I think one of the driving questions, especially um, where I am in, in Europe and the United States, is accountability and transparency um, and, and keeping technology firms accountable. But um, as Dr. Rice said, sometimes the technology moves at such a pace that it's, it's really hard to kind of do both things at the same time. So what does it look like from where, where you're sitting as far as um, technology firms being accountable and, and transparent and keeping the digital ecosystem safe for its users? And what sort of frameworks do you think we can look at, um, especially here in Bangladesh and in the Indo-Pacific region, um, um, uh, on that specific topic? Thank you, Rachel. Um, so I moved into the IT sector eight months ago. And what I realized was it was, a, it was completely baby steps. Because in Bangladesh, what happens is, starting from making a video or a photograph viral, down to moving the money from the central bank, we weren't ready for any of this. So there's a huge expanse that I'm talking about, of events that I'm talking about. Starting from invasion of privacy and going to large-scale international money um, thefts, we are exposed to everything. So as a technology company, what we are focusing on is building that culture of trust. We, we just don't know trust as yet. Um, I'm sure Ben Azibai will share a lot more on this, um, what he encounters. But from us, from I was in a bank before for almost 10 years. And the factor of keeping data private or um, keeping information private and official that concept is still a little alien to us. However, we are working on restricting it as much as possible, having the user be responsible, as well as, of course, setting up the firewalls, setting up security systems and all of that um, in order to keep all our data and all our uh, technology safe. But it's, it's, it's a challenge. It's a huge, big challenge for us. It's, it seems like it's a challenge for, for a lot of people. Um, and Dr. Ahmed, I'd like to, I'd like to get your, your thoughts on that. Um, you know, we were sort of talking uh, before we came on stage about the different viewpoints that all of us can bring to the table here, um, from NGO, to private sector, to, to government and, and police force. So I'd like to um, a, sort of ask you a different version of the question I posed to um, Ms. Maboub, and that is, um, there's a government side of this question to account accountability and transparency. Very much. <clears throat> I think it's very, uh, this is a, not a challenge unique for Bangladesh. Uh, this is a challenge everywhere, well, all over the world. Um, because uh, we have to uh, guard the privacy of the data. And simultaneously, we, uh, we have to secure the data. And in addition, on the top of that, uh, we have to protect our people, protect our national interest and everything. So uh, there is a definitely, um, we have to, either finding or drawing a line is of course, is very difficult and challenging. And for a country like Bangladesh where every day we are learning. And uh, because, uh, you know, this is this uh, idea of dig uh, digitalization, uh, in fact, uh, picked up by the uh, go uh, current government. Uh, and, and, um, uh, th and this government is aggressively pursuing um, digitalization because uh, that leads to our development. And uh, a few minutes back, uh, Kamal Kadir, Mr. Kamal Kadir was here 
Uh, you'll be surprised to know that we have almost a um, couple of billion dollars they exchange every day through the mobile phone banking system. And the people living in the remotest part of the country can uh, now, you know, within the range of the banking system because you don't have to uh, take a bank to the remote village to have, give him access to a, give him or her access to a banking system. Now, just uh, he has his, her, he or she has his phone and his, uh, you know, account number. I can, he can transact money, uh, receive money, send money, and uh, make business deal. So this is uh, this is the way you know country is flourishing. That's one part of it. Again, as a law enforcement practitioner, where every day I'm being challenged uh, by the issue of fake news, by the issue of false news, by the issue of rumors, um, uh, by the issue of false, uh, false personification, especially, um, um, you know, in social media, there is a huge challenge for us because possibly you are aware that almost 2.2 uh, million people using uh, social media in my country and uh, 80 million people are using uh, internet. So uh, it's a huge number. And uh, sometimes uh, people, you know, just aggressively pursue social media, want, uh, want to enjoy different kind of uh, platforms and windows without proper tra training and without proper security knowledge. And this way they become, they become vulnerable to the system. And uh, especially women, I find them uh, often, often they're being blackmailed by uh, different, you know, uh, apps and everything. So, uh, there isn't, so to, to, for me, uh, you know, for the, for the government, uh, we have to uh, make sure that uh, the technology uh, the, we are acquiring aggressively, uh, occurring, it should go ahead simultaneously. We have to protect the privacy of the people, human right issue, yes. We have to respect that. We have a good law in place. And I think that we have, we need um, some other new laws because um, other than this, at, at some point it will be very difficult to, um, either, you know, regulate the huge number of uh, issues that has been uh, thrown before us uh, by the uh, uh, internet and by the social media. Um, you, you made a, an interesting point. You talked about um, you know women using the internet and you know uh, having issues like being blackmailed, but I, I feel like there's also there also can be issues with um, age sometimes. Um, like in the United States, I remember in the lead up to our elections when there were you know fake news reports shared on Facebook. A lot of the people that were sharing them were part of an older generation who maybe haven't grown up with the pervasive use of social media and who maybe have a harder time discerning between you know what's real and what's not. So does it also come down to just media literacy and is there steps that Bangladesh is, is taking to sort of um, educate the, the population to uh, be able to stop uh, issues like this? And uh, Dimitri, I'm going to come to okay. you after that So, if uh, on the same topic. So. Oh, yeah, uh, I think that that's what I possibly mentioned, yeah. that uh, some people even do not know the proper, you know, security features of, of a particular um, internet feature, but they're using that and by this, uh, by this, that way, they, they become the victim of the system by themselves. So that needs, uh, definitely, we need to educate people. Uh, we have to make people aware about that and that's, uh, and that's, that's the process we are doing. I mean, the law, from the law enforcement uh, bar, you know, group we are doing and also uh, some of the ministries, especially telecommunication ministry, they have their projects and uh, to aware people, I mean, even they go to the school to train mm -hmm. uh, school children and everything. And we understand the technology for the technology, the, uh, all the time, uh, older generation are shy about that and young generation are very, uh, you know, no, sh uh, sh shabby, uh, I mean, they, they're tech shabby, so anytime they can, uh, very, very quickly, quickly they, uh, pick up the technology and everything. So that is that is again a, a challenge of digital divide. Yeah. I mean, the older generation and the newer generation. Even even uh, if we uh, the government make it available for everybody, uh, the div divide is there because yeah. of the age, yeah. which you mentioned. Because the older people they are shy about the new devices and everything. And technology already mentioned changes very quick, very quick. And uh, five is not here, but already we are talking. Uh, we are hearing that people are talking about six. G and even it is not defined how it will look like, but people are talking about 6G. So the, this way things are moving very faster, and uh, definitely we have to uh, prepare ourselves for the uh, changing time and the changing technology, so that um, the, the the issue of the law and uh, security in terms of um, business, mm -hmm. in terms of private data, in terms of uh, uh, you know 
uh, you know, other relevant fields where technology is involved. So, Mr. Teparek, coming over to you, um, staying on the topic of, of disinformation, I think, you know, from the U.S. standpoint and a European standpoint, this is something that we've sort of had to contend with for a long time, and there are probably, looking back on it, things that we wish we would have done differently, um, especially, uh, you know, in the, United, in the United States. So, for emerging digital economies, are there steps that, sh you know, should be taken at this stage, at the emerging stage, to counter issues like disinformation. And I mean, I feel like from, from your position in Estonia, Estonia is on the forefront of, of cybersecurity. If I'm not mistaken, NATO's Cyber Center of Excellence is, is based in Tallinn. So if you can just give us some thoughts on you know, this general topic and you know, anything else that you'd like to add on what we've already discussed, that would be wonderful. Yes, thank you very much. I would approach the, that from a little bit different perspective. And uh, basically, we have introduced in my country so-called uh, e-governance and everything digital dozen years ago. So, of course, we have made many, many mistakes, but we also learn from them. Well, e in my country, we have everything uh, like e-governance, e e-health, e-taxation, well, of course, e-banking, uh, e-voting for the parliament, so everything. So we are highly dependent on uh, reliable uh, internet-based systems and, of course, uh, on uh, rule of law in digital world. Uh, say that, of course, I do understand that uh, there are different players and government actors, foreign uh, countries uh, who would like to interfere into your own business. And while well, my country has been attacked by a neighboring country uh, by using uh, cyber, cyber means. So basically, uh, what we propose and what we are cultivating is, of course, a culture of responsibility that every citizen is uh, equally responsible for his or her, not just physical security, but also digital security. So it's not just the responsibility of the state to protect your privacy, to protect your data, and to ensure that uh, all the systems are functioning very well, but it also let's say, responsibility of every citizen to uh, contribute to that. So for that, of course, we have established so-called Cyber Defense League, where active citizens are very welcome to join in order to contribute with their skills and knowledge to protect the digital systems of our country. Uh, we also, well, basically, building resilient uh, society require kind of a comprehensive approach that basically you understand that it's about ecosystems. And, uh, well, parts of ecosystem are non-state actors. It's, of course, businesses, but also uh, people, your citizens. So uh, resilience means uh, skills. So if you don't educate uh, your citizens, if you don't provide them with uh, modern digital skills, then uh, just uh, state actor is impossible to ensure. Uh, the uh, the security, so that that's that's uh, our approach uh, in a nutshell. I'd like to take it back to uh, Dr. Rai and Miss uh, Miss Mahboob. Um, we're talking about you know the misuse of of digital ecosystems, right? And and the the eventual misuse, whether it's through hacking or DDoS attacks, like Mr. Tabarek was talking about, seems a, uh, not a matter of if, but more a matter of when, right? And so I think a big question, and, and you, you talked about this a little bit, is building resilience. And so I think that, um, you know, my question would be, um, if, if, if we're always playing catch up, if, if you know, government is trying to catch up to technology proliferating at a rate that is, you know, sometimes much faster than, than we can contend with. Um, how, how do we create resilient societies in order to bounce back uh, from when or if and when digital technology goes wrong? Um, you know, from, from a public uh, standpoint and then from a private sector standpoint, I think your uh, viewpoints would both be interesting on this if you'd be willing to talk about that. No, if you permit me, I'll just take a, a minute and a half. I will give you a very, very interesting incident which happened in, uh, in the <clears throat> uh, west coast of the USA. And you can see the, uh, the impact, how does it impact there. This was an incident relating to a home. 
where a mother leaves the child, but the child was six months old, and put the baby monitor, and she goes to the market, do some shopping, and then come back to the home. That was the basic thing. She leaves the house, leaving the baby monitor to the baby, and after 15 minutes, exactly 15 minutes, whole kiosk was there on the market there in the, in the market. What happened? That the the DSL modem, the uh, dial-up modem, it, it it there was a vulnerability in the system. The software vulnerability was there. It went to corrupt the baby monitor, and from the DSL modem, it traveled back to the service provider. And service provider, it traveled to the electric grid. All your electric, uh, all your signals on the road was became red, and there was a completely chaos in the market. It's a live incident, I tell you. Is in 2016 there. See, look at it. The it started from a baby monitor and went up to stopping your uh, electric grid, and whole traffic was jammed there. That is the impact of the vulnerabilities, which can create a such a such a kind of impact, big impact it can create. Now, see, I mean, a session, a one session before, before that, uh, uh, one of my uh, friends, he said, the entire thing is a multi-stakeholder kind of thing is there. I mean, government alone cannot do, private sector alone cannot do that, industry alone cannot do that. So it's a multi-stakeholder kind of effort, and there are certain principles which we need to adopt, as a government need to adopt that. There are already efforts going on in regard to creating or agreeing to that, creating a framework for volunteer norms of behavior. How do you, be, how do you uh, uh, behave in the cyberspace there? there? <coughs> a lot of things have gone through. So far, we have not come to any, any conclusion in agree, any agreement to that. In between, now, the little modification has come, stability of the cyberspace where the volunteer norms is a subset of the stability of cyberspace. So they're talking about it, and one is the protection of the critical information infrastructure. And when we talk about the protection of the critical information infrastructure, that infrastructure which serves the general public, there, like you have electric grid, you have a public uh, internet infrastructure, the switches, the exchanges there, those kind of infrastructure. That's one aspect of the protecting the infrastructure. The second aspect is your creating the awareness there and the skilling you part create that aspect there that has to do that. And the third form the government can do that is the uh, legal framework to address those issues which arises there, the aspect, and associated infrastructure part. And uh, I mean, uh, some of them are can be done uh, by the governments uh, independently within the within their own country, but some of them like protection of the uh, internet critical infrastructure where you have the routers and big uh, uh, things there, root servers are there. There you have to follow the international kind of a scenario. You have to follow that. But the prime most important aspect is the to skill the national their nation their citizen by various means creating and the awareness. That is, uh, is a more very, very important that today we are in a world where we should not look the technology like a consumer toy. We look at it as a professional kind of a tool. We have to use it for professional purposes so that other is not impacted there. So I think the skilling and awareness, that has to start in a massive scale in various forms and the, it's a multi-stakeholder industry also has to come forward to work, I mean, a step by step along with the government to achieve that. Thank you. Your thoughts as well? Thank you, Dr. Rai. Um, taking on from what he said, when the car was invented or when the airplane was invented, you needed certain flight hours to be able to fly the airplane and you need a license to drive a car. But what is it that you need to open a Facebook account or um, just use technology? We don't have that basic education or the basic regulations in place that will allow me to be a viable user of social media. This, I think, is one of the f basic challenges out there because this is what has happened. The digital ecosystem has grown so fast and so big that um, 
anyone and everyone is on it. And so we're not all on the same plane. And that is the challenge I'm facing. Um, people will come in, look at our data, steal it, go away. Even though I have um, them sign deeds of NCAs and NCAs at um, our organization, they just think it's all right to do that. And they do that because, unfortunately, law enforcement and rules and regulations in um, our cyber security system is not, has not played catch up with the digital ecosystem yet. So that's where we are, the, the huge divide is, and it's a huge challenge for people like us. Uh, Mr. Taparik, I saw your head nodding vigorously as, as she was speaking. Is there something you'd like to add on this topic? And before you do, I'd like to ask um, audience members to start lining up for questions um, because I'm going to turn to you um, after uh, the gentleman next to me stops speaking. So if you could start getting those ready, I'd appreciate it. Over to you. Yeah, I completely agree. And the, so the key word was, of course, awareness. And uh, well, of course, I. I don't believe that uh, just regulating the ecosystems would help because you know awareness is a key issue if our citizens are not uh, aware about uh, threat so basically their threat perception is so low they don't understand uh, what kind of impact let's say a cyber attack uh, domestic or a foreign one uh, could uh, could have potentially then uh, any law enforcement could couldn't help so basically, what we have to start is basically building uh, awareness and relying on realistic uh, threat perceptions uh, in, uh, in civil society. And that's, of course, a huge challenge, not just for the government, but also for uh, yeah, NGOs and schools and uh, uh, other, other players. And well, the difficulty is that uh, almost every cyber attack in the world, uh, even very well attributed, let's say, to s such players like China or Russia, uh, it's always uh, perceived, uh, followed uh, by disinformation campaign. So how to distinguish it? So basically to understand that, uh, well, cyber domain, virtual domain has become a place for uh, warfare. It's not anymore, of course, in some countries it is still anymore about conventional weapons, and, uh, but uh, more and more what we are seeing that, uh, you know, virtual battles are happening in, uh, in cyber domain. Thank you. So I'd like to bring the audience into this um, discussion, but before I do, just a couple of ground rules. Um, just state your name and, and your affiliation, and we have about 20 minutes, and I'd like to get to as many people as possible. Please keep your um, questions brief, and please ensure that they're not rambling comments. Please make sure that they actually end in a question. So, gentlemen, right here, thank you very much. I'm again of Bangladesh from the youth group. My question to panel is, to prevent misuse of the digital ecosystem, what do you think of moral education and patriotism among the students and younger generations? Thank you. Did you get that? Someone want to jump in? Sure, go ahead. Thank you for your question. Um, yes, moral education is extremely important, just the way we say we start from the very beginning. However, it has to be shown as an application. Don't gossip is equal to don't share somebody's video on YouTube uh, or don't make something negative viral. So these correlations have to be made. I can tell people not to lie, not to cheat, and do many things, but when we are making people aware, we need to give them examples of what it is in the general context and the cyber context. So that, of course, would be very effective if we started applying it in the larger scale. Thank you. Yeah, I just add, if you permit me. See, the two factor, two things are necessary. Today's way, the complication and the complexity is increasing because of the technology. One is the awareness, the child should be given awareness, awareness should start at a young age of four years there. I remember when I was in school in the, that age, we used to be given a Red Cross book there. And the teacher used to ask, please write one good thing you have done in that particular day. 
uh, whether you have taken a blind man to cross the road or something like that, you, you are, we are encouraged to do those things there. I think today the moral education is, uh, is very, very important. We have to start from the young age of four years old there. That's one important factor has to come up. And every school should participate or maybe you have to give, you have to create a course circular where they get a weightage and marks for that kind of a, uh, things there. Second is that equally important is the self-responsibility regulation of the internet companies also there. They, I think the business model which we have, that will undergo change as the technology moves on, as the system moves on there. But I think there should be a, some uh, self-introspection, self-regulation by the internet companies also. Thank you. Does anyone have anything to add or, yeah? Just to add shortly, uh, well, there's a lot of research done on uh, the issue gentlemen uh, spoke about. Well, th the thing is, well, the problem is that, you know, every behavior, like in physical world, but also in online environment, can be kind of fixed by rewarding or punishing. That's like human psychology works. I mean, very, very basic. So if such behavior we are talking about is not being punished or being rewarded, it's practically impossible to do that. I mean, so we have to introduce that kind of uh, you know, system in our ed education that such behavior could be at least not, not rewarded, but because now, you know, kind of uh, anonymity uh, in the internet and, you know, spreading, you know, so-called fake news, gossips and so on, sometimes is being rewarded or at least not punished. And that brings me to the question of uh, law and law enforcement. Are we good at that or not? Thank you. Thank you. Keep turning this off. Are there any more questions from the audience that anyone has? I thought I saw someone. Okay, yes. Hello, my name is Partha Pratimburva. I'm from BIS. So as a young person, I like to uh, ask this question that uh, we young person uh, uh, do not actually trust, in many cases, we don't trust uh, electronic media or television and search news. So we put our trust on social media for news coverage and search. And since we do that, we put our trust in social media for news. Uh, that actually works in a negative way because uh, we don't uh, we get we trust news that are not that doesn't go through actual verification. And so we easily believe, uh, easily if I trust false news. So how do, you, uh, how do you change that? How do you remedy that? Thank you. Dr. Ahmed, can you offer your thoughts on this? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, uh, this is interesting. Uh, I don't know why, there must be reasons. The mainstream media losing its audience. And now time has come that mainstream media must investigate why they're losing their audience why they're losing their trust. That's one part of it. Second part, part of it is, is what uh, this young gentleman has mentioned, that the young generation easily, um, you know, they believe uh, what is there in social media, Facebook or whatever. In fact, when the social media uh, came up, we, uh, and the idea also uh, came up at the same time, the idea of citizens reporting, right? So that uh, meaning that um, there'll be an open or free flow of news and information with the you know, emergence of um, social media, Facebook, Twitter, uh, whatever, I mean, um, YouTube or whatever. But uh, simultaneously now, the, we are now watching that there's a tremendous uh, number of, uh, huge number of, significant number of misuse uh, be, are, are happening. Uh, we are, uh, the, I already mentioned that we, we have the incidents of false news, uh, fake news, rumors, and gossips and all this thing. So uh, now, it, again, this is the question of what we have already discussed, the panel has discussed number and again, that awareness. That is critical. Also, a tough regulatory regime, strong policy. And so skill, awareness, a strong regime, of uh, regulatory regime and strong policies. That should be the way we, should, we have to handle this. And um, in, in the world of social media, seeing is not always believing. See, the jurisprudence <laughs> will change over a period of a time. <clears throat> Whatever we are seeing, 
the current jurisprudence is related to the real world there. Now, when we go to the virtual world, the jurisprudence will change. It's a matter of time. Maybe you can take a 10 years, not more than 10 years. Things will change. Thank you. We're going to go back to the audience for questions. I could ask questions up here all day, but I want to make sure to can get you involved in the conversation. The gentleman right here, thank you so much. Pro make sure the microphone's on. I'm Naran Chandra, oh. ex research fellow of BIDS. Uh, actually, my question relates to uh, use of uh, digital facilities for uh, determining uh, genuineness of cases. So, uh, actually, uh, we don't know what is the scenario in Bangladesh, whether we are using um, uh, digital resources, digital facilities for identifying the convicts, identifying the events and cages, and wh whether we are using the uh, digital facilities for replacing the uh, uh, false witnesses and all these things. I think uh, this question relates to uh, our honored person, Benzir Ahmed. I understand you right, uh, meaning that the service providers, what they're offering us, uh, do they uh, uh, make sure that uh, who are the users? Something like that? We can uh, use uh, the call records for uh, uh, determining the uh, genuineness of the events and the identification of the uh, location of the convicts. So. Uh, and we can use the... You are talking about the judicial system, right? Right, right. Uh, yes, we, we, uh, we, there is a project ongoing in Bangladesh so that um, audio video, visuals are accepted in the court of law and also the you know, uh, digital images, digital prints we leave behind in different transactions, not only financial transactions, in so many ways um, we, we leave behind the footprints that is also acceptable in the eye of law. That is a project going on. I think that within a very uh, short possible time, these uh, you know, uh, uh, issues will be uh, acceptable um, in the court of law. Thank you. And but uh, you know, one more issue that uh, which Bangladesh is suffering, and that needs a tremendous cooperation, serious cooperation from the part of the different uh, business providers. Um, the KYC, that's a big issue. So uh, anybody can go in the internet, what uh, Ms. Mabu was uh, telling that, open a Facebook account, or a Twitter account, or, so, or something like that, but they, there is no KYC. And if uh, there should be a strong regime uh, on the part of the service providers, so that whenever necessary, and there's a misuse of this kind of platforms, uh, we can really catch hold of the criminals. And we understand with the growing number of uh, use of uh, this uh, social media and everything, we are seeing that the terrorists are using this, you know, platform. And if you go to uh, a search uh, in Google or Yahoo, whatever, you will find millions or billions of uh, materials uh, motivating you to be a terrorist. But very, very negligible number of articles or resources that demotivates you. So, uh, so the thing is that uh, uh, we need to have a kind of, uh, uh, I mean, uh, self-imposed uh, parameters by the you know, business uh, conglomerates who are offering this kind of product to the society. And KYC is very, very important for that. So we have about 11 minutes left. Um, I'll take a couple more questions. Um, if there are two questions, I'll take them um, all at once. So there's a gentleman Right yes. here. Yep. Um, <clears throat> I wonder if you can hear me. Uh, there's a slight overlap. Uh, my name is Kavi Arya. I'm a professor from IIT Bombay. Um, there's a slight overlap in the uh, topic of this panel and the, and the earlier one. <clears throat> the earlier one was on monitoring on and offline hate speech. Well, this one is on uh, trying to prevent the misuse of the digital ecosystem. So it's kind of related. And the last panel came up with four very succinct uh, uh, identifications of, of how to tackle it. Perhaps I'll toss these at you and ask you what else might we add into this basket, if you like. The first is a gentleman called Zafar said there should be zero tolerance for the consequence 
of any hate speech because you cannot, you cannot edit it out while it's happening but you can see the effect and take action on the effect. So there should be zero tolerance for the consequences of hate speech. Uh, one gentleman called Obroy said that there should be multi-stakeholder uh, collaboration to identify what is hate speech or not. So that's trying to catch it at the root, right? Trying to identify multi-stakeholderally what might be hate speech or not. Someone else said focus on offline, that means all that moral uh, uh, teaching and stuff like that, work with the community, educate them, try, try to change their behavior. And um, uh, Mr. Tekwani said that hold your governments accountable because a lot of the misuse actually comes from the government, right? Whether it's in cyber warfare, whether it is misuse of the system, often it is originating from governmental actors or perhaps non-state actors also, but these kind of uh, uh, people. What can you add to this, these four things? Thank you. I'll have you hold on answering this just for one second. Did I have, did I see a woman right here who wanted to ask a question? My name is Shami. I work with uh, United Nations Youth and Student Association of Bangladesh. Um, to my understanding, I completely agree with Ms. Zara Mahabu that uh, we were not ready for this technological revolution. But now what? What is the set solution? To, to my understanding, sometimes, sometimes I feel like sh banning all the social media is the only solution because people were actually not ready. It's just not because people who are not literate, uh, people who hasn't gone to the university or school college, but I see very educated, typically educated people, they comment so many weird stuff and the way they speak on social media, the behave, it's not the right way. But, so what is the solution? Okay, and last question right here, and then we'll bring it back to our panel for a wrap-up. Thank you. I'm Git from Ethiopia, eastern part of Africa. Uh, I have one question, uh, mainly associated with uh, electronic election in Indo-Pacific areas, uh, associated with the challenges of cyber security. Thank you very much. Thank you. So if we could just go down the line and uh, tackle any of those questions you, you, you would like and offer um, any concluding thoughts to this panel. Thank you. I have a very quick comment on how to uh, define which is a um, hated speech, which is not. I think it should be guided by the law of the land. That makes life very easy. Because uh, then, then you know, different approaches will bring different issues uh, on the table and make things critical. And uh, in all democracies, they have promulgated laws, so it should be guided by law. And uh, for the young lady, yes, uh, we cannot, you know, uh, he, I, I, we are opening the windows and the flies are coming in, but that's why you cannot close the windows. So the thing is that uh, we have to very, very quickly adapt to the, you know, technology. So that is the, um, uh, I mean, uh, quick way to deal with this. And I, I believe that, uh, Especially if we talk about our country, uh, people can really, really quickly adapt to technology. That they can, they can do. Thank you. If I, may, yes. if I may add, um, well, while the law of the land will um, regulate what zero tolerance will entail, it's the implementation of the law of the land. When I go out there and make a hate speech or I offend a community or I offend somebody, what is it after that that is done? I can just say, yes, that was hate speech. But implementing a result from the, uh, an action, which of course goes back to you, so uh, the regulators and the enforcers, so that's where we have to work on. And as for Shami's uh, point, unfortunately we can't ban the digital uh, growth we cannot it's out there it's happening so it's a combination of what the gentleman said earlier moral education and also putting up the regulations for usage of social media um, ensuring they're not multiple accounts on facebook or on instagram or any other place just the guards have to be up as we drive through this path because um it's it's a highway and we are not going to stop no one's going to stop so we need to put the speed breakers on on our vehicle and we need to actually um, on the roads and we need to drive very carefully. See, the, <clears throat> the two things are very, very important. I mean, if I have to distinguish, one of the audience has said it. One is the norms of behavior in the cyberspace 
we should, there should be a broader agreement within the country and the inter-country. That's very, very important. How do you do that? Because the companies are going to operate from anywhere in the world and anyone in the world is going to access the services there. So that is very, very important. That includes your manufacturers who supply the equipment, who design the equipment, and, and so and so on there. That's one very, very important in today. The second aspect is that in, in spite of we agree with the norms of behavior, there will be cyber incidents, as I said, because of the technological induced vulnerabilities, technological induced processes and procedures there. So it is important that those cyber incidents will bring down the efficiency of any country. So countries must have an understanding, they work together to exchange of information relating to cyber incident and try to work together to try to attribute the incidences there and to, to investigate and to work out a solution so that those incidents can be prevented and many other, uh, uh, I mean, user or many other areas or countries can be benefited. As I said, very clear example, I said one third of the California or the uh, western coast of the U.S. was shut down in 2016, that is it. I inherited that. So norms of behavior, countries and organizations working together to help each other in, in addressing the incident and solving the incident will, will go a long way in reducing the vulnerabilities in the system or reducing the misuse in the system. And it's a huge, big challenge for our economies in India, Bangladesh, with the populations that we have and the number of Facebook users. I mean, Bangladesh is a small country, but we have 180 million people, and uh, we're one of the top Facebook users in the world. So the challenge is with the number of people. So that is where, uh, where we live, unfortunately. Okay, I'll close the panel with you. Yes, to wrap this up in a nice little, nice little bow. <laughs> well, very briefly, uh, well, uh, I love a phrase from the uh, Alice in Wonderland. So basically, wars, threats, and good intentions uh, do not account to actions. So we have to act. By saying that, I already mentioned, you know, providing skills, really tangible skills for uh, general public. That's one thing. Another thing to add to the basket is to invest into human capital to provide, uh, I mean, to produce more uh, digital researchers, those who are able to analyze big data. Another thing, we have to scrutinize uh, big tech companies that could allow us, as researchers and governments, access to the, the algorithms and big data in order to understand what is happening there. It's really necessary. But, you know, actions is something uh, we have to rely upon, and speaking about use of uh, responsible or irresponsible use of, of social media, of course it's uh, up to us, but just to recall that social media was uh, intentionally invented to improve communications between people. It wasn't invented to provide you better access to the political news, really, it, it, it wasn't. So why it's so appealing to a younger generation, because it's not even uh, in, like, in, informing, it's uh, infotainment, I mean, it's uh, provide a lot of entertainment, but the good thing, oh, well, the other thing is that uh, a lot of disinformation and ideological propaganda is now happening not just in social media, but also in gaming. Yes, that's another, th I mean, virtual reality, that's another thing we have to, uh, to look at. So basically, yeah, actions, 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 that would be uh, my suggestion, thank you. So basically, there's just disinformation everywhere, that's what, we, yeah. <laughs> that's what we land on. Unfortunately, that's not the happiest note to land on, um, but uh, we are out of time, um, and I think this concludes the second day of the DACA Global Dialogue, so thank you everyone for being here, and please join me um, in thanking our panelists as well. I must thank you for such a coordinating the panel so nicely. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. Thank you.